Okay, so this is our research context um, for this particular example. This is actually the same um, experiment that we talked about last week. This is the developmental psychology experiment. So we used this data for our one sample t-test last week. Um, just to briefly recap, this is looking at developmental psychology research question, and we're looking to see um, if we can explore the, uh, the effect that music has on infants, and particularly whether music can play some kind of social function from an evolutionary perspective. Um, all of that background is available in that data set summary document up on iLearn. So if you want to have a read of more, in more detail, um, you can also go to, to go to the paper itself to have a look at the actual details of the study. You can possibly hear the galahs screaming outside my window as I record this lecture. Um, and the particular hypothesis that we're trying to address here, it was very related to the one that we talked about last week, is looking to see how much time infants spend, so how much time babies spend looking at different adults and seeing if they spend more time looking at adults who are singing a familiar song, a song that's familiar to them, compared to an adult who's singing an unfamiliar song. The key variables in the data set, the first one we talked about last week and the second one is new to us. Well, actually, I think we talked about both of them last week, but the first one here is the variable that we used for our analysis last week. Um, both of these variables are looking at the proportion of time that the infants spend split between the two adults, looking between the two adults. And the first variable is the proportion of time at baseline, so before any kind of manipulation has happened. And the second one is the proportion of time under the test condition when one of the adults is singing that familiar song and the other adult is singing an unfamiliar song. So what we want to do is to compare the amount of the kind of split in time for under the test condition versus the baseline condition. So even though we've got two separate variables in our data set, and you'll see in the next slide or two what that actually looks like, um, I want to make a distinction at this time between the actual kind of physical variables in our data set that we're using to address this particular research question and to do this test versus conceptually the variables that we know that we're thinking about. So we've got two variables in the data set here. Both of those are proportion of time variables just under the two different conditions. But conceptually, we've also got two variables, but they're slightly different variables. So conceptually, we have the distinction between a dependent variable, our outcome variable, and our independent variable, our grouping variable. So our dependent variable here is the overall proportion of time that the infants spend looking between the two adults. And we know that that variable is measured under two different conditions, the baseline condition and the test phase condition. And that condition variable is our independent variable here. Okay, so this is um, just a screenshot of what the data look like in Stata. So again, it's the same data set that we were talking about last week, or one of the two data sets we were talking about last week. And you can see here I've highlighted these two variables that are key to this particular research question. Um, the baseline proportion of gaze is the first one on the left, and then the test condition proportion of gaze is the one that's highlighted on the right. And remember, as like every week, you can actually access this data set yourself so that you can play along with the tests that I'm doing because that's so much fun and it's very necessary for you guys um, using this web use command that's written down the bottom of the slide there. So you can use that to pull up the data and you can actually parallel the analyses that I'm doing in my lectures all for yourself. So if we wanted to summarize these two variables, because that's a really important thing to do before we do any kind of test, just to understand our data, to describe our data, then we could use the summarize command in Stata, like I've done here. And we can get it to list the summaries, the numeric descriptive statistics for both of these two variables. So you can see the baseline proportion of gaze is the first row, and then the test condition proportion of gaze is the second row. And remember, like we said last week, um, if the infants spend an even amount of time split between the two adults, then the proportion of gaze will be around 0 0.5. 0 0.5 meaning there's sort of a 50-50 split in terms of um, the amount of time they spend looking at one adult versus the other. In the test proportion of gaze, you can see that the mean proportion is 0.59. So that's slightly higher than 0.50. And that's indicating at this stage that infants spend slightly more time looking at the adult who's singing the familiar song compared to the unfamiliar song. So about 59% of their time is spent on average looking at the familiar song adult 
and about 41% um, of their time is spent looking at the unfamiliar song adult. So that's just looking at the descriptive statistics here. What we don't know at this stage is whether this 0.59 is significantly higher than this 0.52, because obviously these are just the mean scores, the average scores. And remember that when we're looking to see if there's a difference between the groups, we need to take into account both the difference between the actual means but also the amount of variability around each of those scores in each of those groups. As a little shortcut kind of side note here, um, when, you're, when you're typing in commands into Stata using the command line, so when you're typing the code in rather than pulling up the options from the menu system, you can see here that, this, that the command to get the descriptive statistics is the summarize command. What you can do to get the exact same output, instead of having to write the whole summarize word, you can just type SU instead, and you'll actually get the exact same result. So it's just a shortcut. Um, it's just a shortcut that Stata will recognize where you don't have to write the whole command name. You just type a couple of the letters, SU particularly, um, and it will still give you the same table. And I'm gonna show you that on slide 14 in particular. Okay, the next thing that we want to look at is a histogram for both of these variables to see if we can compare the distributions between the two. Um, similarly to what we're looking at in terms of the numeric summaries here on slide 9, but slide 10 just gives us a pictorial or graphical representation of the distributions. So you can see here that the blue bars re represent the baseline condition and the see-through kind of clear bars represent the test condition. So you can see that in both of these conditions, there's a, quite a range of scores. There's quite a spread of scores, which is, is exactly what we would expect in any kind of psychology experiment because people are different. People behave in a different kind of way. Um, some babies will spend more time looking to the right. Some babies will spend more time looking for the, to the left. Um, there could just be differences in terms of the adults about what attracts the babies to look at. So there's obviously going to be variability here. But what we can try to get a sense of looking at this graph is, on average, do the people in the test condition score higher than the people in the baseline condition? And we can see that the answer at this stage is yes, that we can see that the clear bars are a little bit more shifted up to the right hand side compared to the blue bars, which are a little bit more shifted down to the left hand side. So because we're representing our data um, in these tables and graphs as if they're two separate groups, you might be asking at this stage, why do we actually need a different kind of test? Why can't we just use the independent samples t-test to be able to undertake this statistical test to see if there's a difference between the means? Um, and that's a very fair question. That's a very valid question. And hopefully I will address that question adequately over the next couple of minutes. So the reason for um, us needing to do a different kind of test, a test that takes into account the related nature of our observations here is the first point, obviously, it's actually not two separate groups of babies, two separate infants, two separate groups of infants. It's the same infants measured twice. And the fact that it's the same people, the same babies, but the same people in general, giving two different scores is very, very key to us needing a different kind of test to undertake the data analysis. And that's because there tend to be similarities within an individual's person's behavior. So if we have one person give two scores, if we have two scores that represent the same person, those scores will tend to be related. That's just because people tend to act similarly, not exactly the same, but similarly, even if it's under different kinds of conditions. So because there's a similarity between people's scores, because the scores are more likely to be similar between a person compared to across people, if we can actually take that into account in our statistical test, we can actually get a more precise estimate of the effect that we're investigating. So if we can choose a test, in particular the paired samples t-test, that can take into account the related nature of our data, it actually means we can get a more precise, a more powerful test, because what it does is it reduces the variation across people. And remember that when we're calculating the t-statistic in terms of that formula, that formula is a signal to noise ratio and the noise is representing the variation, the variability. If we have less variability in our data as a result of the way that we've designed our study, and if our statistical analysis can recognize that and take that into account, 
it actually means that we end up with a more precise, a more powerful estimate of the effect. And that's a really brief overview of why doing a different kind of test, picking a different kind of test, is a really beneficial thing for us rather than just using the independent samples t-test. All right. The next thing that I want to talk about is this assumption of normality. So I said to you before that one of our assumptions of the paired samples t-test is that the different scores are normally distributed. And that's exactly what we're going to be talking about now, conveniently enough. So um, when I say the different scores, what I mean there is the difference between score one and score two. So in this instance, if we had our score and the baby's score, their particular value under the test phase, and we minus their score at baseline, that gives us a different score. And the different score is just representing how different those two numbers are. So each participant, in this case each baby, has one particular different score. So we've got 32 different scores that we could calculate. And the assumption of normality for the t-test specifically applies to those different scores. And the reason for that is because it's the different score itself that's directly being tested in our paired samples t-test as you will see when we actually get to the formula itself in a little bit of time. So looking at the data set again here, the data set actually already contains a different score. It's this one highlighted here. It's called the difference in proportion looking. And this is just how um, different the numbers are between the, um, the test proportion of gaze value minus the baseline proportion of gaze value. So if you just take this number and you minus that number, then you get the different scores. So it's literally the difference between the two numbers. If it wasn't already in our data set, we could very easily calculate it ourselves, but conveniently for us, it is already existing in the data set. So very briefly recapping the normal distribution, remember that there's five different elements or five properties that make up a normal distribution, and those are listed there. And we can see if our variable is normally distributed by looking at the numeric summary statistics, by also looking at our histogram. And what you can see in the histogram here is that we do have something that approximates a normal distribution. It does look vaguely like a normal distribution. It peaks in the middle, it's got a tail on either side, it's relatively symmetrical. It's not perfect, but it looks vaguely like a normal distribution. And like I've said to you before, what we're not looking for here is perfection, we're looking for something that is approximately normal or kind of normal enough. When you get more experienced in looking at these histograms and looking at the numeric stats, you do develop a better sense of how normal is normal enough. But particularly when you're first learning all of these things, it can be a little bit difficult to know what is normal enough versus abnormal enough. And so the next thing I want to talk to you about is a particular test of normality, which is called a Shapiro-Wilk test of normality, that we can use as a statistical test to see if the population from which our sample is drawn is normally distributed, whether the variable that we're talking about here is normally distributed in the population. This test is only relevant to numeric variables, to quantitative variables. It's completely irrelevant for categorical variables because normality doesn't apply to them. Normality is only a thing that's sort of discussed that's relevant for our numeric variables. And the important point here is that the test of normality, this particular test of normality, is very, very useful for us to use, but it's useful for us to use only if we use it in conjunction with the other pieces of information. Only if we use it in conjunction with the graph and the numeric descriptive statistics. So we use it as well as looking at the histogram like we did on the previous slide. And as with any statistical test, it has a null hypothesis. The null hypothesis for the Shapiro-Wilk test is that our data are normally distributed in the population. That says is, but it should be are because data is plural. So our null hypothesis here is that the data are normally distributed in the population. And because that's our null hypothesis, we actually don't want a significant result here. And by significant, I mean a p-value of less than 0.05. What we want in order for this assumption to be met for the Shapiro-Wilk test is a non-significant result, a p-value bigger than 0.05. So how we get our test, if we go through the menu system, then we go up to the statistics menu, summaries, tables and tests, across to distributional plots and tests, and down to the Shapiro-Wilk normality test. And then we get, we get a little menu that pops up and we just need to select this difference variable because remember this is the thing that the assumption of normality applies to. We need to select that from the little drop-down menu. 
and then click OK. Or if we're doing this through the syntax way, through writing out the written command, then the command name is called swilk. So swilk, and then we just list our variable, our difference variable there. And we get some output that looks like this. This output gives us some information, including the number of observations, so 32 observations. The W here is the actual Shapiro Wilk test statistic itself. The V is a measure of effect size, but feel free to completely ignore that because it's not relevant for what we're talking about. Um, the Z score is the statistical test. It's the actual test statistic in the form of a Z score. And then the P value is the thing on the right hand side here. So a, a, a statistically significant result in this instance would be represented by a P value less than 0.05. So because our p-value here is 0.7, it's much, much, much bigger than 0.05, which means that we do not reject the null hypothesis, which means that our assumption of normality is met. So we can assume a normal distribution of the variable in the population from which the sample was drawn here. Okay, so going back to our assumptions, we know that our outcome variable is on a, on a numeric scale because we can tell that by having information about the variable itself and also looking at the data. We know that our, dis that our different scores are normally distributed because we just checked that. And we also know that we have related observations in terms of the pairs of observations, but we also have independence across the babies themselves. So the 32 babies are still 32 independent babies. And just recapping this process from last week and from the week before, remember that this is the process, either the left-hand side or the right-hand side, that we go through in order to actually calculate the test statistics themselves. The left-hand side is calculating by hand, which again, we will do just so that you get the experience of what the test statistic is actually representing. Um, but if you had the data yourself and you were doing this in terms of a research project, you were doing it using the computer program like Stata.